It's nearly been 5 years since Breath of the Wild changed the world, and almost 10 since the game that ensured it had to. Yeah, Skyward Sword on the Wii has always been a bit divisive among the Zelda community, with some people loving its intricate motion-based combat, unique temple designs, story implications as the first game in the timeline, and most importantly, Groose! While other people bemoaned it for mandatory swingy swing, gameplay that's linear to a fault, and Groose again! Just kidding, everybody loves Groose! But there is an 85% chance that it isn't the case for Fi, Link's computer-like companion who accompanies him on his entire journey, like Cortana the Master Chief, if she had a lobotomy. And Fi is infamous for just not shutting up, which in hindsight might explain why Link forever chose to be a silent protagonist. And now, 10 years later, Skyward Sword is back in HD on Nintendo Switch, but with some pretty big improvements like a 1080p resolution and 60 frames per Groose. Er, second. <laughs> Sorry, I just had Groose and his amazing pompadour on the mind. In addition, motion controls can now be turned off entirely so you can use buttons instead, the camera can now be freely controlled at almost any time, which is awesome, the game now automatically saves your progress as a failsafe, among with other quality of life tweaks have been made that streamline the overall experience like having fewer of those infamous mandatory interruptions from Fi. <laughs> but don't worry, she's still plenty annoying. These are all fantastic additions and changes. But is the Switch version truly the definitive one to play? And even if it is, does the decade-old gameplay hold up in a post-Breath of the Wild world? We're going to answer all these questions and more in Game Explain's in-depth review of Skyward Sword HD, based on a full replay of the entire 40-hour campaign. Now you probably don't need us to point out the most obvious upgrade. Though if you do, might I suggest an eye exam? Skyward Sword is crystal clear on Nintendo Switch, running at a massively improved 1080p and a rock solid 60 frames per second, which is a first for a 3D Zelda game. And it is glorious. And it's not just rock solid, but it even addresses slowdown from the original game, like the stuttering that would happen when activating time crystals, which is fittingly a thing of the past. The sharper, smoother visuals help bring new life to the fantastic animation and facial detail. Environments are now razor sharp, which makes navigating areas like the sky even better since it can more easily recognize distant locations. Text and icons have also been updated and resized, looking much sharper while being less intrusive. Although, the lock-on arrow seems to have been sadly neglected. Aw, poor lock-on arrow! I appreciate you, even if no one else does. Skyward Sword truly has never looked better, but the increased sharpness does come at a price. The game is starting to show its age. Characters and environments are distractingly low poly at times, like Zelda's 2x4 arms, or the cardboard trees that litter the forest backdrop. And unlike some of the other Zelda HD ports, the texture quality sadly hasn't been touched up here at all, lending the entire game a blurry, softer look. The sky in particular hasn't aged especially well, with clouds that lack dimension and textures very obviously repeated across the sky islands. Or skylands? Skylands, right? Oddly, an effect in the Wii version that gave the backgrounds a painterly, watercolor-like appearance has been removed entirely on Switch, which I kinda miss. But for those new to the game, it's something you would never know was missing unless you had some jerk pointing it out to you. Ruined! I'm sorry, everyone! Despite showing its age, Skyward Sword is still a pleasant game to look at, and even has a handful of gorgeous show-stopping moments. But the overall appearance is undeniably dated, and it most certainly won't ever be mistaken for a modern game, unlike the other Zelda HD ports which almost could be at times. At the end of the day, this is still hands down the best Skyward Sword has ever looked, and the buttery smooth frame rate is absolutely worthy of praise. But how well does the game handle? Well, the motion controls have overall been faithfully translated to the Joy-Cons, behaving almost exactly as it did on the Wii, with the right Joy-Con taking over for the Wii Remote, with a swing or a thrust of your arm controlling your sword, whereas tilting it controls pointer-based items as well as steering link when flying, skydiving, or swimming underwater. 85% of the time, give or take, they work great, but the times that they fall short can be infuriating, such as how it would constantly misread whether I was trying to aim a bomb or throw it instead, which is a pretty annoying problem when it's a combustible item. There were a lot of links harmed in the making of this video, but occasional issues like that aside, the motion controls generally do what you need them to, but they still ultimately fall a little bit short of the Wii version for a few different reasons, including one change that completely baffles me. So one often misunderstood and underappreciated element of the original Skyward Sword was how it ingeniously used a sensor bar to automatically and invisibly recalibrate the controls. Now, since the Switch obviously doesn't have a sensor bar, recalibrating is now left entirely up to the player by tapping the Y button whenever the controls feel a little bit off, which is annoyingly often. 
While the sword itself is relatively resilient to gyroscopic drift, the tilt and pointer controls that are used for the slingshot, bow and arrow, among several other things, are almost always immediately off-center, requiring me to recalibrate them almost every single time. And this is a new problem introduced exclusively in the Switch version, where the cursor now appears where the game thinks you're pointing, rather than the dead center of the screen, as it did on the Wii. And it's pretty terrible, as the cursor almost never appeared where I expected it to, often even spawning at the edge of the screen, which then causes the camera to rotate all by itself in that direction, instantly throwing off my aim even more. It baffles me why this was changed, because it worked just fine before, and would have actually helped remedy the calibration issue I was just talking about, giving you a chance to easily recenter the controller. I eventually learned to just recalibrate the controls every time I used a pointer-based item, including between hookshot targets. I shouldn't have to, but hey, at least it works. Finally, and this is a minor issue I admit, the tiny Joy-Cons just don't feel as good as the Wii Remote and Nunchuck did, which had a sturdier, heftier feel, closer to the hilt of a blade than a Joy-Con could ever hope to be. It's a small, nearly inconsequential thing, but I was surprised by how much more comfortable I felt going back to the original hardware. And what can I say, but I kinda love its dumb little speaker too. Despite my gripes, the motion-based swordplay still impresses 10 years later, even if there are now plenty of VR experiences that translate your movements far more accurately than Skyward Sword's 8-way directional combat can. And that's partly because nearly every encounter in Skyward Sword was designed to take full advantage of the intricate swordplay, and it makes for a supremely satisfying combat experience when you land a precise blow. It feels great, especially when combined with the musical notes of sound off during each hit. Oh, I love those. And what can I say, but I just really love slicing up these trees too. Haha, <laughs> take that forest! So by and large, the motion controls work well enough, but the amount of times I had to recalibrate, especially when using the pointer, chips away at the immersion that the motion controls are otherwise striving to provide. Of course, one of the big new selling points is that they can now disable motion controls entirely if you want to, and opt to use the buttons and sticks instead, which isn't just a great option, but it's an excellent accessibility feature too. The right control stick takes on sword detail, just snap it in any direction to make Link swing that same way, or click it in for a stab. It's simple and works well, as long as you realize you don't have to do a full sweep side to side. Snapping it from the center to the edge works just fine. Now it can feel a little cramped on the tiny Joy-Cons, but it felt great on the Pro Controller. The one drawback is that it does make using the new free camera slightly inconvenient, now requiring you to first hold the L button as they otherwise share the right stick. It's also not quite as satisfying as actually performing the swings yourself, so it's for those reasons that I generally stuck with the motion controls. Plus, I'm a bit of a purist and wanted the full motion control experience. Mostly. Because I'll admit that button controls for flying and swimming are about a million times better when using the control stick instead of the imprecise and uncomfortable tilt of the Joy-Con. My wrist can only tilt down so far, Skyward Sword. Regrettably, the game doesn't let you mix and match control styles, so I usually found myself enduring the motion controls for those segments because constantly toggling them on and off is annoying. Though I would switch over if I knew I'd be using them for a while. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at you, Tadtones. Now beyond all of this, Skyward Sword HD has seen a few subtle tweaks throughout the game to streamline and improve the overall experience. Several of Fi's once mandatory interruptions have now been reduced to optional engagements. All the text in the game can now be sped up or skipped entirely. Most cutscenes can now be skipped too, though annoyingly not all of them. Auto saves have been introduced and can really save your hide if you forget to save yourself, while also effectively acting as a fourth save slot. And there are now new checkpoints, I'm pretty sure, during some aggravating missions, like escorting this darn robot up the mountain. These are all fantastic changes and definitely make for a smoother play experience on the whole. Although I do think they could have gone a bit farther at points. The game's opening still takes way too long even with the improvements, and other segments like those tedious tad tones haven't been adjusted at all. Which is a tad tone deaf if you ask me. As a remaster, Skyward Sword HD is pretty great. The changes are almost universally for the better, aside from that baffling pointer adjustment, and it truly has never looked better. While I do wish the developers would have gone a little bit farther at points, such as by upgrading the textures, the game is still overall pleasant to look at. But how well does it hold up as a game? Especially after Breath of the Wild. Well, there are elements of Skyward Sword HD that I absolutely love. The characterizations of Link and Zelda might be among the best in the series, humanizing them to a far greater degree than most of the other games, which is ironic given some of the lore implications Skyward Sword reveals. The temples are consistently solid, if not great, with a general focus on fewer, larger rooms. They are less concerned with being a labyrinth and more focused on interconnectedness, which I quite enjoyed as a directionally challenged being. The boss fights make good use of the unique sword-based mechanics, and although the puzzles are your classic pre-Breath of the Wild Zelda fare, there are some brilliant ones in there, like how the time shift stones let you experience two different time periods at once. 
The final dungeon of the game might be just one of the most brilliant in the entire series. I also surprisingly really enjoy the Silent Realm challenges, which is thrilling as you try to collect everything you need while evading capture. Oh, and the final hour or two might just be among the best in the entire series. But... Yeah, you knew there was a bug coming. The truly great parts are connected by endless slog of fetch quests. Whether it's looking for song fragments, forest penguins, holy water, or any number of knickknacks, someone is always begging you to find something for them. I'm pretty sure there are even fetch quests within fetch quests, and it quickly becomes tiresome. Especially because many of them require you to use a Master Sword as a dousing rod, which basically has you pointing it around randomly until it starts beeping, indicating the direction you need to go in. It's not fun, it's just annoying, and feels like complete filler. It doesn't help that the sky, which connects all the regions together, is a complete waste of time and space. It offers the illusion of an open world, but doesn't have anything interesting to find. Look, a rock. Oh wait, what's that? Oh, another rock. You begin the game in the most and arguably only interesting sky location, and it's all downhill from there. One of the very few locations of note is Fun Fun Island, and I'm pretty sure the name's a joke. It is literally run by a clown. The sky is little more than a glorified world map, with the annoying step, or should I say flap, of having to fly between locations. And then there's the elephant in the room. Skyward Sword is linear to a fault. Every puzzle has a single pre-designated solution. Every locked route just the one key through. If you get hung up on a particular puzzle, boss, or what have you, that's it. Figure it out or go home. Now look, there's nothing inherently wrong with linearity, but Skyward Sword pushed what was already becoming a tired formula to an extreme, which now feels even more restrictive and claustrophobic after Breath of the Wild. I really was hoping that revisiting it would be like coming home after a long vacation, being familiar and comfortable, but it felt more like returning to your childhood town after living much of your adult life elsewhere. It's recognizable, sure, but strange at the same time. There are still things to appreciate about it, but you've moved on and it can be hard looking back. Ultimately, playing through Skyward Sword HD gave me a newfound appreciation for Breath of the Wild. But to Skyward Sword's credit, it was a necessary stepping stone in getting there, even birthing a surprising amount of ideas that would later find its way into that game, like a stamina meter, flying, material collecting, and even floating islands, at least if we include Breath of the Wild too. Skyward Sword is filled with a lot of great ideas, but its archaic, linear structure buckles under the weight of the series' grandeur ambitions. I'm still glad I replayed it, especially in what's otherwise a pretty great HD remaster, and is almost certainly worth picking up for huge fans of the original game or the rest of the series that follows a classic Zelda formula. But as a gameplay experience, it can be a bit tough to revisit after experiencing everything the Skyward Sword isn't. And yet, I still liked it overall, even if I was tempted to drop it at points. Its motion-based gameplay, unique overworld puzzles, and intricate temple design are all elements that can't really be found anywhere else. Plus, that final hour or so really is super great. It's just important to know what you're getting yourself into if you've only played Breath of the Wild, as Skyward Sword HD offers a very different experience, one that I'm sure some people will prefer. And there you have it, our review of The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword HD for Nintendo Switch. Thank you so much for watching, and of course make sure to click that subscribe button and ring that bell for tons more on Skyward Sword HD and everything Nintendo Switch. We'll catch you later. Bye, everyone.